I want to just share uh, a couple of quick thoughts. I've been reading through the Bible in a year with uh, Pastor Mark Hinman and our friends at Hillcrest Baptist, and other churches actually are in on that. Um, And it's been a really wonderful discipline for me. You know, I typically read through the Bible every year in different ways, and uh, this year I've been listening to it more than actually reading it. And I love having the Word of God read to me. I found that out. I didn't always think that that was my preferred method, but it is. And uh, my friend Tom is here with us today. If you see Tom after the service, uh, he'll be hanging out in the gallery probably. You can find him with a cup of coffee. But Tom uh, was the victim of a house fire several years ago, and uh, 95% of his body was burned. And um, he'll he'll tell you the story in more detail if you'd like, but... uh, God brought him through the fire. And when Tom, when Tom came out of his coma, I was there that day with some others. And um, <laughs> I was praying over Tom. And I go visit Tom. And if you've ever been with somebody who's been in a coma, they're, they're not responsive. It's not a responsive thing. You're just kind of there. And I was, in the beginning, I felt like I was talking to myself, but I was not actually. Tom uh, was very much present and, and there. And uh, I remember I was praying over him, and I was with a, a group of men, and we had gone up to see him and to pray over him. And when you're, if you've gone, if you've been the victim of a burn, or you know someone who has a serious burn, he was in a room that was like 180 degrees. It was super hot, and the humidity was really high. And you're sweating when you're in there, and uh, that's so the body can heal. And he'd been in a coma, I think it was for five months, maybe. It was a while. And we're praying over him, and uh, the guy next to me starts slapping me. Pastor Joe, he's looking at you. I'm like, Tom's eyes were open, <laughs> and he was trying to talk. One of the things that I would do is I would, as I would pray over him is I'd sometimes read scripture to him. And uh, when I went back the following week, he asked me to just read him the Bible. And I read to him from the Psalms. And this is what Tom said to me. He said, I have longed to hear the word of God again. And I just want to encourage you, if you're not in a Bible reading plan or if you're not not accustomed to hearing the word of God, maybe start today. You know, it takes about 15 minutes out of my life to hit play on the little button on my phone. It's amazing what smartphones do now. We've got a resource for you as you exit the sanctuary. You'll find that little table there, there's a, a link that says digging deeper with a QR code. You just scan it. It's amazing. But just listening to the word of God, maybe early in the morning and starting your day with the Lord. We've been walking through uh, the story of Joseph in the Old Testament. And uh, it's amazing the words that God uh, calls to my attention while I'm hearing it read versus when I'm reading it. And I just, I want to encourage you, it's, it's a great discipline, it's a really simple thing, if, you're, if your schedule's kind of full and you're not sure when to do it, maybe on the road while you're driving to work, right? Don't listen to the, the talk show in the morning, I know those guys are funny and stuff, but maybe just hit play in your car for a few minutes and see how the word of God over time will begin to change the way that you process through life. That's my invitation for you. Uh, I'd like to pray and then we'll dive into what God has for us today. Jesus, thank you for the word of God. Your word uh, says to us, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And Jesus, my prayer for the church that you have entrusted to me is that the words contained in scripture would become like honey on our lips that it would be sweet and pleasing and that the living word would reign in our lives and that your Holy Spirit would bring power and that we would be faithful disciples of Jesus, the risen Christ. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Uh, So today we're going to dive into uh, the fourth part of our five uh, part series. So you want to be a disciple. And it's been this invitation over the last several weeks to, to take faith really seriously. 
This invitation from God was not that we could be passive in the faith. It was that we would be, you're either all in or you're not in. It's one of those deals, right? You can't, you can't live with a foot in each canoe. That doesn't go well. And uh, last week we talked about some of the disciplines in the faith. And one of them that, that I highlighted on was the discipline of confession and the significance of confessing your sins one to another. And, uh, you know, I was richly blessed. I was, last week I was preaching at Park Church and I had all three services. So it's kind of like... We call it the gauntlet, Brandon and I, Pastor Brandon and I, because you go from one to the next to the next, and there's 12 minutes of driving between the second, the, the second service and the third service. And uh, on my way up, I was able to put on the worship service from Bemis. And I came on just, and I have no idea who it was, I asked later, just when Vicki Boughton, I think, was praying for her pastors. And that was captured on the live feed. And I was richly blessed, uh, not just to know that you're, you pray for me and for Pastor Tom, but that you did it right then and there. That was, that was a gift to me, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, but this week we're going to be looking at the, the final couple of phases of being a disciple of Jesus, and that's being a minister and a witness. And I know when you hear the word minister, what do you think of? You probably think of this really super intelligent human being like Tom. <laughs> but the, the word minister means that we tend to someone else, actually. So we're going to come back to that. But we're going to look at the, the, the book of Acts for our instructions. And Acts is a wonderful um, beginning story of the early church. If you want to know kind of how things got started and what it looked like, the book of Acts is a, is a wonderful reflection on that. And it was written by Luke, the same uh, physician who wrote the gospel of Luke. And you kind of see that in the writings. But where we pick off, pick off, we're not picking, I was thinking about the Bills game still, I guess. Where we, sorry, listen, I, I also went to the game last week and yeah. We'll talk about that next year. There's always next year. We're Bills fans. I know. I see you sitting there in your San Fran gear. You're the only one in a jersey today, by the way. <laughs> well, okay, the San Francisco fans. Anyway, uh, we're going to pick up the story. We're not picking off anything. We're going to pick up the story um, after some significant events in the life of Jesus. While we were singing that third song, I was... Uh, overwhelmed by the reality of who Jesus is. Very God and very man. The Nicene Creed got that right, actually. And uh, remember that Jesus was crucified, that he died, he was fully dead, he was buried in a tomb, and Scripture says that three days later he rose from the dead. He continued to walk on earth after the resurrection from the dead for 40 days. He was witnessed by many people. Many people saw him, hundreds actually, 500 at one time. If you want uh, proof in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there's a wonderful uh, debate between Gerd Lunemann and William Lane Craig. Jesus' resurrection, fact or figment. It's a wonderful read. It's about a debate that a a wonderful theologian and a philosophy professor uh, who left the faith get into about was Jesus' resurrection real? Because if you can't believe in the resurrection from the dead, then why would you consider yourself to be a Christian, to be frank? We believe in a bodily resurrection. And that bodily resurrection took place, and uh, Dr. Luke records in Acts, the first chapter, these words, and I, I have to back it up a little bit, so if you're following along in the bulletin, it's not accurate, that one's on me. I want to back up to the fourth verse for a, a couple of minutes. It says, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, that's Jesus uh, he's talking about, he gave them this command. He said, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait Underline that word wait in your Bibles or highlight it. Do something to call your attention to it. He says, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It says, so when they met together, they asked him, 
Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Sorry, the kingdom to Israel. And Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know the time or the date the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power. You want to highlight that probably. We all like that word power. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We see these concentric circles kind of building where the witnesses are taking place. And he said this, he was taken up and after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid them from their sight. Can you almost, I kind of, I can almost picture that. Standing outside, talking to Jesus, and then away he's going. Have you ever watched the Jesus hot air balloon? I mean, seriously, people, it's probably very similar to that. I don't know. I wasn't there, but it says that he was taken up before their very eyes. So I picture it was like this, and then it went like this. And probably the mouth thing, too. What would your response be? Because the cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. I'm sure as he got further and further away, just like the balloons that you might let go at times, they started to squint to try to capture that last image of the Messiah. It says, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them, men of Galilee, I wonder if, uh, how badly they startled them. You know what happens when you get really scared? I don't know. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Witnesses to the world. That's what Jesus told them they would be, a witness. I'm not an attorney, although my wife would tell you I probably think I am at times. But I do know that a witness is somebody who speaks the truth about an event that they saw or they experienced. And uh, there's a couple of words in here that are important. And I want to back up just for a minute to uh, verse 8. So remember in verse uh, 8, I invited you to underline or highlight the word power. Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. So once you've received the power, then you become the witness. Now, a couple of things that you should probably understand. That word uh, will, does anybody's Bible say something different there? You will be my witnesses to Jerusalem and Judea. Anybody else use the word shall? Someone, yeah, there's, you guys are reading like the NASB or the ESV or the New King James or, right? A little more literal translation. It's actually a better translation. If you were to talk to one of your attorney friends when a document says shall, is there any option on that being carried out? The answer to that is no. Shall is a binding term. You have to do this. Where I most recently became acquainted with this was in our United Methodist Book of Doctrine. Doctrine, not dictrine. Doctrine and discipline. In our United Methodist Book of Discipline, I uh, became acquainted with the word shall and what it meant as I talked to some attorneys as to what responsibility as a church we were going to have in disaffiliation. And they said, well, any of the shalls they're supposed to carry out. There's no room to move on that. It's binding. Huh. You see, will doesn't carry with it quite that sense of you have to do this. In other words, what we're reading from Jesus is you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you have to be my witnesses. I know that that terrifies people. The thought of having to share about the faith. 
Some of you get really amped up to do that and others are like, please, anything but that. I wish I could find you a way around this text, but I can't. If you are a follower of Jesus, you shall be his witnesses. So rather than finding a loophole, because that's what I sometimes like to do, I decided I was going to give you some maybe practical ways that you could do that, okay? To start the process. The first is you need to understand that word power, and that word power in the Greek is dunamis, which you don't have to know that stuff. That'll be on the test later, but you don't have to know it right now. It's the same word that we get dynamite from. And if you've ever played with dynamite, you know that it's got a lot of power contained in that little tiny package, right? It's actually not a, a great translation for that because when we, when we hear that they receive power, we think that they kind of walked around and all of a sudden were blowing up things. And while they were kind of doing that, that's not the implication of it in the Greek. The power that you receive, and one, uh, one preacher said, a better word might be dynamic. But all of a sudden, they received something that they hadn't ever received previously. A couple of weeks ago, we lit the light. You remember the light? And Mike Martin was having a hard time figuring out why it wasn't working. I just love to harass that poor guy. But uh, once we figured out it wasn't plugged in, you had to remain plugged into the source. Remember that analogy that we used? Well, uh, the power is the current that's running through it. The disciples had to do something, though, to receive that power. Do you remember what it was? They were to go into Jerusalem and wait. At a time in history when people are not accustomed to waiting for anything, this is, I think, the single greatest thing we miss. You know, I get frustrated in the Chick-fil-A line if I got to wait more than five minutes, and they're the ones that have done drive through really well. There's McDonald's that I just simply won't go to because the wait's more than like seven minutes. We're impatient people, aren't we? We want things right now. If the internet is bogged down, we fire the internet company and get a different one. I mean, think about this. The Lord's invitation was to wait. Wait. Some people in my life that are really good at being patient. One of them is going to lead you after the service in a time of waiting and listening to the Lord. The team that I get to work with, with Britta and Kaylee and Andrew and Tom and the others, these, these folks are good at being patient on the Lord, listening for the Lord to speak. If you're going to be a witness you need to receive the power. And the power comes when we wait. Now, a couple of things that might be practical ways for you to begin, because most people at this point are thinking, I agree with what he's saying, I'm still terrified to do it though. To tell somebody else about what God has done for you. I had a really cool opportunity this week to pray with a woman. Um, this was just yesterday actually who was terrified that a person that she knew and was caring for didn't know Jesus. And my guess is you all know people who don't know the Lord. And if you don't, you need to get some new friends, okay? But if we don't know the Lord and our appointment that everyone will at one point keep comes, we spend eternity separated from God. And that's the saddest thing in the world, honestly. You being a witness gives them an opportunity to at least hear about Christ. Three simple steps. The first one is pray. Ask God, Lord, help me be a witness for you today. Give me some courage. That word comforter, when it 
talks about the Holy Spirit, we, we associate that word with like someone who comes and, and uh, comforts you when you're sad, like a, a mother would comfort a child. Or That word comforter actually means one to give strength and courage. So come, come God and give me courage and pray about it. If you're a little bit more meek in your approach to this, if you're, if you're really nervous about it or you're like, I, I can't do that, well, you should probably pray about it. Ask God to help you. The second thing is start in the comfortable. Listen, if you're really nervous about this, I, I mean, I don't necessarily suggest walking downtown and with a sign, okay? Start with somebody you know that's a Christian. Come and tell me your story of faith. Come and tell me it. I would love to hear what God's doing in your life where you've seen God at work, where you've experienced the miracle of God, come and tell somebody that knows the Lord. Maybe it's the person sitting next to you right now or behind you or in front of you. And then the third thing is, and you'll remember this one. You remember the acronym KISS? Keep it simple. Now, we're not going to use that one, but I thought about that one. Silly. We'll use silly, okay? It's a softer way of... Keep it simple. You don't have to dive into deep theological conversations and explain every verse in the scriptures. Just simply tell somebody else what you have witnessed. You know, I don't know. I had a headache. This guy prayed for me, asked Jesus to heal my headache, and all of a sudden my headache was gone. I don't know what your experiences are, but that was my experience. You're being a witness to what you've received. As you do that more and more, you're going to find you're telling the story in more significant ways all the time. We're called to be witnesses. Ask the Lord to help you. Start in the comfortable. And please, keep it simple. Secondly, is we are called to minister to others. I love it when people minister to me. (laughs) That's when we do nice things for each other, when we actually are the body of Christ, right? Sometimes we're really quick to say things and really bad at following that up with actions. If you want to read a story about that, read the book of James. James makes it really simple that faith without works is no faith at all or dead. Our lives have to reflect the witness that we're talking about. In the process of ministering to others, what do you think that looks like for the early church? You can read about that in the, in the chapters to come. It says that they were all together, sharing their belongings and making sure that everyone's needs were met. That's what it means to minister to someone else. Sometimes it, it means that we, we stop what we're doing and we engage in real attentive care to the other human being. In a world where time is of a very valuable thing, right? That, that is like, I can't tell you how many people tell me they want to make more hours in a day. I'm glad the Lord set that up because so, we'd, <laughs> we'd never stop working. Maybe the single greatest thing you could do is just to stop and be present with somebody. I just sat in that room sometimes with Tom because I felt a little weird talking to somebody that wasn't responding. That's just me being very candid. Maybe it's just being present with others. If you took the survey, some of the questions that popped out, and and these are ones that kind of jumped out to me. Remember, the survey helped you get a metric for where you are, right? I I coach uh, girls basketball, and right now that's a great analogy for me because it's live, it's active, it's right now. And, um, you know, I, I don't, well, there's probably one who thinks she's going to play in the WNBA. She carries the name Pasco. <laughs> there's a very important word in all of that. Do you remember, did you catch what it was? There's one who thinks she will. I mean, Riley's a good little basketball player. I've seen some really gifted athletes. She's also only 5'3". <laughs> she's probably not going to play in the WNBA. The vast majority of them, though, are going to do great things if they can grab a hold of this next thought. They also need someone who loves them enough to say, hey, this is where you're at. These are the steps that you got to take to improve on that. 
That's what the assessment is designed to do, to help you kind of get a sober understanding of where you are in this thing called faith, in this journey with Jesus. And if you haven't done it, there's some cards out at the table. QR code it, download it, print it. It takes like 10 minutes. If you're really feeling like, I really want to do this, you fill out one and give one to somebody else. Preferably someone that knows you pretty well. Right? I, I can't fill one out and give it to my mom. You know what my mom would score me? She'd give me sixes on all of them and all you can get is five. Oh, you're just the very best, Joseph. Mom, if you're online, I love you. <laughs> right? I mean, give it to somebody who's going to give you a sober and an honest assessment of where you are in a journey of faith. Some of the questions that popped out to me were, are, are you meeting the needs of others? Meeting the needs of others provides a sense of purpose in my life. Are you fueled by doing for other people? How about I share biblical truth with those I serve as God gives opportunity? If you desire to do that, but you realize I don't know the Bible, so how on earth am I going to share biblical truth if I don't, don't, please don't make stuff up. Let me tell you what a lot of my counseling involves. Unpacking made up things. Don't do that. Just share biblical truth. You can go right here and everybody has access to the same Bible. Okay, uh, another one, I act as if others' needs are more important or at least as important as my own. I help others identify ministry gifts and become involved in ministry. How are you engaging in ministering to others and coming alongside them in life? So three things that maybe might help you with this. One is Pray. Are you seeing a common theme here? Before you engage in stuff, why don't we just spend a couple minutes talking to the Lord about it? For me, it's God help me, right? It's that, it's that simple. God help me do this. And all of a sudden, I find that the thoughts that I have are different than the thoughts that I've had about the same thing previously. The second step is uh, be patient. One of the things that I know many of us are navigating is anxiety and fear. And if I could just be, be, be very pastoral for a moment and say, that's not, that's not of the Lord. It's in direct conflict with what the Bible says. It says that, that God has not given us a spirit of fear, actually. But you know, the spirit that God has given us is of power. We heard that word a few minutes ago in, in Acts. And of love and of sound-mindedness. And if you're navigating anxiety or fear, write this down. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Read it. And then if I could just be so blunt to say, really try to do what, what God is saying to do right there. He gives a very simple roadmap for A plus B yields C. But in the fourth verse, maybe it's the fifth verse, it says one of the key pieces for what dismisses and moves anxiety out of the equation, it says the Lord is near. In the presence of the Lord, scripture says there is fullness of joy. When we are aware of the presence of God, it transforms who we are as human beings. It puts the things that we maybe are prone to do at bay. Ministering to others, you become that presence. Pray, ask God to help you, be patient, and engage actively in love. That looks different in every situation. I'm learning as, uh, usually through mistakes, what it means to engage in love. Sometimes it means not saying anything, right? I can't tell you how many times I've said something and it's been the wrong thing. <laughs> Maybe it means actively praying for somebody. Maybe it means providing for their physical needs. If you know somebody is hungry, give them a meal. If you know somebody has no no shelter, no roof over their heads. Provide them a place to stay. Some of you are so good at this stuff. 
engaging in the ministry to others, especially those that are marginalized or in, in great trouble. Engage in love. And then I want to close with the last statement. One of the things that the church has done over the years is we've been really good at, at meeting needs. Okay, this is sometimes referred to as the social gospel. Or we've become a humanitarian organization where we care about your physical needs. And we neglect one of the key pieces. We're not just physical. We're also spiritual. It's not a sermon for today, but I'd love to... Maybe I should preach a sermon soon on, on who we are, right? This dynamic of mind, body, and soul. We're triads. And that's the significance of the bodily... I, I'm going off track. I should probably come back. That's the significance, though, of the bodily resurrection, that the body is restored. Once we've helped to meet the physical need, we also need to meet the spiritual need. And that's what the church is equipped to do because you've received the power from Almighty God in the person of God known as the Holy Spirit that dwells within you and then ministers to the other person. Jesus gave this command to the disciples and it wasn't just an invitation, it was a command. He said, go. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, you go. And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And that little word, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Teaching them. Coming alongside them. Engaging in life with them. You know, uh, when we started this chapter, I don't know if you caught it or not, but one of the best ways to teach somebody takes place uh, in the fourth verse. It says, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, there's something about the dinner table. There's something about that moment when we position ourselves in a vulnerable state and we eat together. And it breaks down the walls. And I just want to encourage you, church, you're doing a great job. But we do live in a community that is still loaded with darkness. And you are the God bearers in that world. You are the ones who take the power that has been given to you and administer it to someone else. So will you deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him? Let's pray. Holy God, thank you for your grace, which is sufficient for me, the worst of sinners. God, I pray that this morning your church not only would receive uh, some knowledge, but God, that they would have received the power of the Almighty to go. And Lord, that we would minister and that we would engage in life with others, in love, and that we would allow your Holy Spirit to move us from where we were to where you would have us be. Father, help us to wait until you say it's time to go. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to pray for you. Jesus, thank you for your church. God, reveal to them today who you would have them minister to. God, reveal to your church right now, who you would have them witness to. And Lord, give them the courage and the strength by your comforter to go and make disciples that the kingdom of God may come on earth as it is in heaven. That we might experience the joy of sharing and the peace that surpasses understanding. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And may the Lord God Almighty, church, give you his peace. In the name of Jesus, the risen Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless you, friends.